Welcome to the Merrimack School District School Board for September 23rd, 2024. I call to order this meeting and ask everyone to stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance with us. Thank you. I'd like to note for the record that board member Jenna Hardy is excused tonight. I wanna to open the floor open for public participation. We have two times of public participation at all of our meetings. If you would like to come forward, we have a microphone at the back there and if you'll just state your name and your address. If you are a student, you never have to state your address. So I'll open up the floor. Seeing none, we are going to move on to a really exciting recognition tonight. Well, and here's where I'm going to invite our legislative delegation to come on up here too, and you, Lori, um, and Rosemary, if you, you would like to uh, explain what this is all about. Uh, first of all, we are going to honor uh, just an outstanding young man in our school district, uh, Matthew Brown. and. Matthew is one of life's great leaders and great contributors. Um, when he was in the eighth grade, he proposed uh, some legislation that um, would add eating disorder helpline number to the back of student IDs. Um, it has now been enacted into law. House Bill 1109 was signed into law and is known as the Matthew Brown Act and uh, Rosemary, if you would like to continue with the rest of the presentation. Okay. Matthew, I'd like to invite you up, if you would. Um, thank you. It's not every day that uh, a state representative or state senator gets a call from an eighth grader asking if they could pass a law to add an eating disorder helpline to student IDs. And you did, and because I don't like to file bills that don't solve problems, I asked, well, could you give me a problem statement, explain why we need this? And you did a great job, and it was such a learning experience for me. And I was so proud to work with you on this bill. And not only did, did you shepherd it through the process, but you educated so many other legislators. I mean, how many times does somebody get a bill named after them? You know, a committee votes to amend a bill to name it after someone, especially someone so young who can't even vote yet um, because it, it's such a pro profound impact in our state. So um, we have the statute here for you. Um, it's the original statute. It's signed by the governor, the president of the Senate, um, the House Speaker, and the enrollee officers. So I hope you, it's always a reminder to you, I, I should have kind of taped it up, but um, I hope it's a reminder to you of all the hard work and the true impact. The work you did on this and shepherding this bill through will save lives. We don't know how many, but it will save lives. And I'm so proud that we had Senator Chanley and Representative Mur Murphy. Also, Representative Boyd was a local co-sponsor. Unfortunately, he is unable to be here. But we've all signed the back with well wishes for you and congratulations for, for your success. So thank you so much. And if you can And on behalf of the Merrimack School Board and the Merrimack School Administration, we also want to prevent, present you with a certificate. We are so proud of you. We've engaged with you a number of times in this last school year, and it has always been a pleasure. I also would like to say that Representative uh, Rung shared with me that you are very well spoken, that you did a great job testifying before a very contentious education committee, which tends to fall along political lines, and you brought the committee together for such an important cause. And so we love to see your passion and your willingness to serve your community, your fellow students in the state of New Hampshire. So Matt, what I wanna say is kind of being the historian is um, your grandfather, John Zilo, was state representative for the town of Merrimack. 
So again, he would be very proud that you're carrying on his tradition. I just wanted to add how proud I was to be able to testify in support of this bill with Matthew and to listen to him hold the attention of 20 members of the Education Committee and they were astounded how articulate he was um, and it was the committee itself that went forward with that amendment to name uh, this bill after Matthew and call it the Matthew Brown Act. That wasn't something that was asked for. They, they thought that he certainly deserved credit. So Matthew, it's, I think this is just the beginning. We're going to see a lot of Matthew, and we're so proud and, and delighted. We were, we were delighted to co-sponsor this bill. So thank you, Matthew. As, as Rosemary said, you will, you, you will save lives. So thanks. And finally, I'll just take a min minute to say that this bill originated in the House, and it passed the House, but it had to then come to the Senate. And that's not always an easy task, but your hard work proved very successful. Um, it passed the Senate, and of course, then was signed by the governor. It's a tribute to you, and certainly a tribute to your family as well. Um, your family, your teachers, they've all played a role, I'm sure, in helping to shape who you are. And um, we can only look with um, great hope and anticipation to the future and the role you will play in our community. Thank you so much, Matthew. And may I uh, just say also that Matthew was a very actively engaged member of our strategic planning committee at every meeting and participated in every single meeting. And Matthew, when you are the governor of New Hampshire, <laughs> I hope you'll remember this night. Thank you again for everyone that was here tonight, our legislative team and Matt. We just, we just love what you're doing. Thank you so much and just keep it up. All right, we will move on to our informational updates for tonight, and I will turn it over to Bill for the superintendent update. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to uh, recognize the fact that we received a $11,500 robotics grant, um, and um, the Merrimack High School, as you know, is very, very actively engaged in uh, robotics, uh, hosted a an event a couple of weeks ago, which was very, very successful. Um, also at the high school, the classes of 2025 and 2026 are banding together for a mattress sale on October 6th at the high school from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if you are in need of a mattress, don't go out and buy one just yet. Wait for the uh, event to happen on October 6th, and that, uh, that money will help benefit the class of 2025 and also the 2026 to help offset a lot, a lot of the very high and increasing costs associated with graduating from high school and all of the, uh, all of the events associated with that. Um, from Ron Beck, um, very proud to say that um, this year for the first time ever, the New Hampshire Music Educators Association has put together an all-state modern band. Students submitted auditions to participate in this group, which will play a variety of uh, genres, from rock and pop to jazz and heavy metal. Now, there were only 12 students selected from across the state, 12 in the entire state. Four of them were from Merrimack. That's Brianna Barlow on vocals, Adelina Kamlin, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name, on vocals, Colin Plum on keyboard, and Kayla Poria on guitar. Uh, the concert that these four students will be participating in will be held on Wednesday, October 16th at the Sheraton Nashua at 4 p.m. This is an extraordinary recognition for these four students, and when you consider that one-third of them come from Merrimack in the entire state of New Hampshire. Just absolutely outstanding. 
Uh, Patty Fernand has let me know that um, Scooter is a comfort dog that uh, makes an appearance at the high school, has already been placed into action in terms of helping some students who um, have experienced some degree of um, anxiety and a little bit of trauma in their lives. And uh, she is looking after Scooter, and um, that has started very successfully at the high school. Uh, from Julie DeLuca at TFS, I want to thank the parents and the teacher group uh, for two brand new Gaga pits. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to actually see what that what that activity is like. I'm, I, I know of it. I'm, I've never seen it in action, but I'm going to have to go over and see it one of these days uh, soon. Um, and they've also provided some additional ADA, Americans with Disability, compliant tables and seating on both of their playgrounds, which is, which is extraordinarily important. We want everyone to feel welcome. We want everyone to feel comfortable in the fact that we are providing accommodations for those who may have some degree of disability. Uh, TFS, once again, this year has received a uh, school grant, uh, a farm to school grant of $6,000 to continue their work on the hydroponic garden that they have in the school. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see it, but it's extraordinary. And they, last year, I remember I was over there for a day and they were harvesting some of the produce uh, for the cafeteria program. And so uh, we congratulate uh, the staff who, who have worked on the hydroponic project is a fascinating project the kids are very, very much uh, interested in. And congratulations also to Brooke Ross, the assistant principal. She has been accepted into a doctoral program at Plymouth State University. And um, once again, I want to underscore the importance of our very strong uh, relationship with the Merrimack Police Department. Uh, uh, Bill side. Uh, the school resource officer and member of the police force has provided outstanding training to our staff. Uh, he recently met with the TFS staff. He's going around to all the schools uh, and talking about the locking devices, uh, the avoid, deny, and defend uh, protocols for helping to keep um, us safe. Uh, Matt, Amy, and I will be meeting with Bill along with Jordan Miranda and Dan Lindbaum, our school resource officers uh, in the upcoming week to talk about the training that was conducted during the summer and the uh, I love you guys uh, protocol for school safety, uh, evacuation and reunification. Um, everyone did an excellent job on that uh, school uh, security training and the evacuation reunification process and we're very proud of how that uh, turned out. From Reed's Ferry, um, from Haley uh, Smith. The uh, Unified Arts teachers started their extension classes, uh, some <coughs> extra extra activities and co-curricular in nature uh, for third and fourth grade uh, students. They have 13 fourth graders who are in the gardening crew extension. We have a great first class uh, in terms of working on garden beds. Uh, that's very important for students to understand Kind of the food cycle and the origin of where our food comes from, the importance of uh, responsible gardening and agriculture. Uh, I've seen that in practice in some other districts that I've been involved in. Uh, the students enjoy it very, very much, and it's a very, very valuable lesson for them. Uh, congratulations to Colby Wygant, first grade teacher at Master Cola, um, who received the best Ford, that's a dealership name, Best Ford Nashua Area Best Teacher Award. And she received $500. Uh, and she was nominated by a parent from her class. And uh, congratulations to Kobe for an outstanding job. Um, from Liz Dume at, uh, at our high school. Uh, she said, I can share that, uh, with you proudly that I've been selected to participate in a Navy League Educators at Sea aboard the Norfolk-based Navy aircraft carrier later this fall. You get to experience Navy work centers, primary flight operations, including landings and catapult launches that uh, I will be recording for use in authentic physics problem solving. and have the opportunity to meet and talk with a variety of officers throughout the ship in that overnight experience. 
The Navy League selects STEM educators to experience the various aspects of carrier operations and of aviation to be able to share details and pictures of the experience with their students. And says, I believe this is the first time educators from the Northeast have been selected. So congratulations to Liz. Extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, incidentally, you have to always recognize members of the armed forces. Her father, her grandfather, and her great-grandfather, and a brother-in-law have all served in the U.S. Navy. So to all of them, thank you for serving our country. Uh, from Adam French, fall sports are off and running uh, very quickly and very successfully. Uh, they had a great pep rally uh, involving lots of students from lots of sports. Uh, the Unified Soccer Team had their first ever home soccer game this past Wednesday. It was amazing. And uh, there'll be another one, uh, I believe, and I'll let you know with more certainty, this Wednesday at 3.30 at the Merrimack football field out back. And um, this week, the football team will host Keene at 6.30 p.m. Um, and uh, the football team is participating in the New Hampshire Tackles Hunger Initiative. You know, our student athletes are not only uh, great students and great athletes, but they're very civic-minded and, and very conscious of their role as leaders in the community. And so I congratulate them uh, for this uh, effort. And so uh, thank you to Adam French for that, uh, for that piece of information. Uh, Tammy Lambro has informed us that the online Merrimack High School store is open. Uh, I've checked it out several times. They have lots of great items for sale, and uh, hopefully people will be um, looking that up off the high school main webpage. And once again, um, Emily Dutton from the high school, uh, just as a reminder, the mattress sale from 10 to 4 p.m. on October 6th. It will benefit the classes that are upcoming for graduation, help defray some of the costs. So lots of great, exciting things. Momentum is building and will continue to build throughout the year. And we're very proud of our staff and our students we want to thank all of our families also for their active engagement in providing help and service to our school district. Comments from the board? I do want to also say that while the game did not go the way we wanted to on Friday night, the team did a great job, and Merrimack TV does an awesome job broadcasting those games. So we also want to thank Merrimack TV for all the work they do to broadcast those football games. All right, Assistant Superintendent Amy Doyle. Good evening, everyone. Since our last meeting, we had another full day of professional learning. Um, we continued to work on implementation of our new programs. We spent some time collaborating both vertically and horizontally within our teams, and we are making progress on many of our district initiatives. It's hard to believe that next week is October. I don't know about all of you, but I feel like Happy New Year, right? It's just going to go so quickly, so hold on to your hats. Um, right now, I'm working on the schedule of activities for our early release days, and this will include a combination of mandatory trainings on things like bullying, suicide prevention, um, and McKinney-Vento, or students that are experiencing homelessness. We'll also have some presentations from experts on supporting our multilingual learners and um, continuing to develop to develop our cultural proficiency. And we'll also have um, some time to look at an adaptation of reunification training, crisis management with detectives Vanderside, Limbon, and um, Miranda. As Bill spoke, we'll be setting up a meeting. Um, Laura, you may want to join us for that just because you also attended that training this summer. Um, last week, uh, Reed's Ferry Principal Bonnie Pancho, uh, Bill, and myself, we met with uh, Chuck Mower and John La Stoka um, from the Merrimack Historical Society about a really exciting partnership. They are actively working with Susan Feynman, who works with a national organization on one room schools uh, to bring a living history um, experience to the schoolhouse at number 12 on Post Road. So we went and met with Chuck and John and Susan and talked about what it might look like. It fits perfectly within our fourth grade curriculum looking at New Hampshire history. And so I just want to thank Chuck, John, and Susan for the time that they spent with us. Um, and we're really looking forward to this opportunity. 
And one more uh, grant work to shout out is Sarah Parado. She's working on a second year of Promising Futures money. So like you hear, we also try to leverage any you know, federal funds or state funds that are available to help us to fund initiatives and to bring um, more revenue here to the district. Questions or comments from the board? All right, Assistant Superintendent for Business Update, Matt Chevenel. Yep. Thank you. Um, everybody's heard of the 12 days of Christmas, and I don't want to kind of rush things along at all, but it's just a, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're beginning to start the process of the six months of, of budget, uh, you know, uh, development, right? Because it, it seems to last that long. To that end, last year we brought in a $6.2 million surplus. Um, some people thought that was a little bit on the high side, but it was a $90 million budget. Uh, this year, and I, I said at the time, we're going to try and get to around maybe $4 million, maybe a little bit less. Well, we got to $3.6 million, which is the same amount of surplus that we brought in 14 years ago on a $65 million budget. So it has decreased, and uh, we're not going to have that surplus that we had in the past to reduce taxes so even more so we have to be prudent in the way we develop our budget and being mindful of the default budget also um, to that end as far as taxes go i just want to give you a little factoid that i've said before but now that i have the microphone and everybody's wrapped attention attention back in the year 2000 around almost 25 years ago we got around a little over $10 million in grant money from the state to offset the school district portion of the tax rate. 25 years later, I think everybody realizes that costs for school districts have gone up astronomically. Health insurance, FICA, New Hampshire retirement, heat, light, electricity, wages, contracts, whatever. It has gone up. And 25 years later, we get $9.8 million. So back in 2000, $10 million. 25 years later, 9.8. It's curious just to think of that with an increasing budget and all those things that are stacked upon us. And a lot of that is due to the state shoving, pushing initiatives back on us. They used to pay for driver's ed, 600 bucks a kid. Probably no one remembers that except for me, right? But they don't do that anymore. They used to pay a portion of the New Hampshire retirement system. They don't do that anymore. There's a lot of things that have been pushed down to the local level that are affecting us. However, what hasn't been pushed down to the local level is the amount of grant money we get from the state, hence the continued concern over Claremont that started in 1993. I was around when that was first happening. And it's just not, there's no traction being gained. So I just want to let everybody know and be aware that the grant money that we got 25 years ago is the same amount of grant money we're getting today. And it really should, go, should have gone up at least keeping pace with, you know, the inflationary figure over 25 years. But it hasn't. So just want to let you guys know that and just keep you aware of that. So thank you. I want to add to what you said, Matt, that New Hampshire is 50th out of 50 states in this country in the state portion of public school funding, yeah. with only 5% um, from the state going to public school funding, which means the rest of it has to come in the form of local property taxes. Correct. And that really is burdensome. You know, when you think when you think about it, the taxes you pay and the support you get from the state. I mean, I remember Chuck Moore, he was giving a, a speech a while, while back, and he says, you know, the, the state of New Hampshire doesn't have a spending problem. They have a revenue problem. They don't generate it. You know, you can't, re you can't rely solely on liquor sales and lottery tickets to fund everything. There has to be some other mechanism involved. And this is case in point. A glaring example of what is done when you don't keep up with increasing your revenues somehow. Thank you. Lori. And I was just going to say, so, <clears throat> you know, recently New Hampshire again 
was rated one of the top 10 states in education. But when you read down underneath what you just said, Matt, like if we could figure out that other piece, we'd be number one in the state. But we're, we're in the top 10 because of the work that we, you know, our administrators and our teachers do in this state. But it's just the funding factor that really hurts education. You know, I see the work that teachers do. I see the work that Amy and Bill does every single day to try and become number one. And that's the goal. If you're not in this business to be the best, you don't belong here. And we're all in this business to be the best at what we can be. And I would love to say New Hampshire is number one in the entire, in the entire United States. And we can do that, but it's going to take time. There you go. I made my speech for this evening. Thank you. Any Just other comments? <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> All right. On to the school or board update. I did attend the first robotics event, Mayhem in Merrimack, and it was really an exciting start to their season to see all the teams, to see all the corporate sponsors on their t-shirts, to see how many businesses in Massachusetts and New Hampshire invest into these kids and their teams, um, to see the Merrimack robot doing so well. One of the interesting things about that is it's when new students who are new to the team get an opportunity to show what they can do and drive and so they get to um, participate while the more experienced senior uh, leaders of the team kind of step back and coach. They do the setup. It is a massive undertaking in the setup. And it was just an incredible um, sight to see. And we are really looking forward to hosting another major event here in Merrimack for the robotics teams. I just wanted to note... Um, Coming up in old business, we are going to move our New Hampshire School Board resolution discussion for when school board member Hardy is back. So that'll be moved to the October 7th agenda. And I, this week, will be uh, having the opportunity to visit the middle school once again. I did visit for just hot lunchtime um, this last week, and I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. But I'll be spending some time this week uh, interview, interviewing the principal and visiting some classrooms. I hope to do this with all the schools this year. And so I look forward to that visit and um, sharing my experience when I come back. And finally, uh, we don't have our student representative yet, but we will. Uh, that's why Bill and I were both trying to cover as many announcements of activities and things going on, especially at the high school. But we look forward to filling that seat soon. Any other comments or questions from the board? Yes. I also went to Mayhem in Merrimack and huge, as someone who has planned professional events, I know exactly how much of an undertaking that was. And I was really impressed with the kids on the team who are not just doing robotics, but also doing the outreach to the community and the organizing and um, all of the stuff they have. They're doing stuff. They're going to the elementary schools and, and partnering with like the Girl Scouts to get younger kids interested in robotics. And they're just, they're doing so much. And it was pretty cool. It's truly an opportunity to not just focus on the STEM piece of the work, but also the community outreach, the organizational skills, the social interactions the team building the interaction with the other teams and just the logistics as you said of event planning it's it's a program that provides so many opportunities for them to learn okay since we are moving old business on to october 7th we'll go to new business and i would like to share with you my observations at middle school lunch they are very similar to naomi's observations last spring I attended all three lunches, which there's really two within each block because there is a three minute delay between the groups that are coming to lunch. That is to help move things along. Everything overall ran like clockwork. The longest amount of time it took for the last student in the longest line to get their food was three minutes. They were all on time in arriving. So to the minute they arrived on to lunchtime on time. And for parents who may not have seen this, the way this works is students who have their lunch, they go to their assigned table and their teacher name is on it. This is for um, particularly for the first two lunches. And they sit with their class. If you have hot lunch, then you go get in line. You get your food. You sit down at your table. 
The teachers walk around talking with the students, making sure everybody has their lunch. And then about halfway through, they push the trash cans around so that the students do not have to get up to go throw their trash away. Because as we know, when students get up carrying trash, it ends up on the floor and crumbs and those kinds of things. They don't have to do that. Students raise their hand if they need to use the restroom and there's, all, there's a hall monitor to make sure everything is appropriately happening when students come and go from the restroom. And 95% of the students were finished eating with five to seven minutes to spare. Any student that was still eating was allowed to finish even as they were being dismissed. A teacher usually sat with them, but they were allowed to finish eating. Now, being a mom of six, I saw two things that I experienced even with my kids. Students who talk a lot and don't eat are rushing at the end. Students who are slow eaters, and I have two kids who just eat very slowly, might have a little more trouble getting finished in that time frame. But those were the exceptions, not the rule. I will also say that that was the cleanest lunchroom I have ever been in. Those students clean up their tables. They clean up underneath their tables. The tables get wiped down. It was the cleanest lunchroom I have ever seen. And the acoustic work that Matt and Bill did last year really helped in there. So it's not too loud. It was very easy to hear and talk. And I talked to a number of students and teachers. It was very well run. Now, that being said, I did talk to one of the women in the kitchen. And she said, on pizza day, the lines are longer because more kids want pizza. So they are a little longer, but they actually serve faster because serving the pizza is a lot faster than serving like the day I was there, meatball subs. So it kind of balances out. It may not be three minutes. It may be more like four, but it still moves pretty quickly on pizza day. And on Friday, one of the things that one of the teachers said thinks may be impacting the length of time for students to eat is it's free Friday. They get to sit wherever they want. Students take longer to find their friends and find a place to sit on Fridays than the day they know exactly what table they're going to and exactly what teacher they're eating at that's on the, they have little tent cards on each table. So I think that may be impacting Fridays as well. So yes, they do sit with their class. That is for time's sake and also for students to get to know other students. But on Fridays, they do get to sit with whoever they want to sit with. So that's kind of a balance between what works in efficiency and what the students want as well. Um, I would also say that uh, Principal Bozeman, he does not talk when they're eating or anything like that, but at the end of each lunch block, he counts down. They're supposed to have their hands up and their eyes on him, and he counts down five, four, three, two, one, slower than that, and he praises the tables who are all ready to go. And then he asks everybody to look under their tables. One last look, make sure everything's picked up. And then he dismisses each table. It's, again, very efficient. There was no lag time, but there was also no crowding of students coming in as students were going out. So it was very, very efficient. Having talked to a couple of the students, obviously the first week of school is going to be rough. We know as educators, routines, routines, routines are such an important part of that. And for new seventh graders at a new school, coming from JMU's can be a little bit tough learning those routines at lunch. And so I think some of the concerns, particularly the first week of school, are more related to learning that routine. But by the time I was there, those seventh graders, they had it down. Eighth graders as well come from all over the school versus from a particular class, so they have their backpacks with them, and it takes an extra minute for them to find where they want to set their backpack down and then get to a table, but the eighth graders are old hats when it comes to getting in line and getting their food, so again, it was still three minutes from the last person in line to uh, that student receiving their food. So overall, I was pretty impressed. Again, I'm going to go back next week. I'm going to watch it again to see, you know, if a different day, different food as part of my tour of the school, but I I was really impressed. The teachers walk around, they are eating their lunch as well, and they're talking with students. And it w- I, I just was impressed, I'm sorry, there's just no other way to put it. Lastly, I was talking to a couple of teachers, and longer than 20 minutes, they both said, is when they start to see behavior issues. So 20 minutes, kids get in, they can get their food, they sit down, they eat, they go, and they don't have issues with food flying, 
unkindness between students, students trying to sneak out of the lunchroom or anything like that, that that shorter time period seems to really help cut down on potential behavior issues. I also think not allowing the students to throw their own trash away and things like that also helps curb those potential issues that might arise. With that being said, I'll be happy to take questions or comments. I think you covered it all. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like I've, I've, I have done my fair share of lunch duty in my lifetime, and it's not as anything I wish upon my worst enemy. Um, but I, this sounds like it would not be a bad place to do lunch duty, you know? Um, and again, the longer you have these kids sit in this unstructured time, the more potential there is, and I'm using the word potential, um, for bad choices to be made. So, um, you know, if, if it's three minutes in and out and they're, you find that they're having enough time to eat and socialize and, uh, you know, obviously the Friday being the unstructured day is going to take a little longer for them to, to get seated and, and do take care of all that stuff. Um, it sounds to me like it's going pretty well, but about, about as well as it could be for middle school lunch. I could say one thing. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's, it's kind of like sometimes people look at buses and they say, boy, there's not a whole, the bus isn't packed, right? But the thing is, the bus still has a route to go to. And this town still is 35 square miles. And unless we annex a portion of the town to like Amherst or something like that, whether or not there's 10 kids near the Amherst line or there's only one, the bus still has to travel. And the longer the kids are on the bus, the greater the probability of some misbehavior going on because they get bored. Everybody gets bored. It's not their fault. They're kids. They will do what they will do. That's why we try and balance up ridership with length of time on buses. Same thing in the cafeteria. You give them extra time, people get antsy, that's when the behaviors start to happen. And it's not their fault, it's just the way it is. I'm sure if Bill gave me extra time during the day, I would probably act up also. So, it's common sense. What are you looking at me for? There's no probably. I was gonna say, there's no probably about that. <laughs> Well, again, I will say that the middle school administration and teachers do a great job to uh, keep us lunch in the lunchroom going as smoothly as possible. The uh, food service workers do a great job servicing the students, very friendly faces, uh, a lot different than when I was in school. And uh, the food looked pretty good. It's just 1040. It's a little early for me to have lunch, so I did not partake. But I will, I will again, I, I will check it out again next week. Um, to see if there's any major differences, but I think the middle school administration and faculty and staff are doing a great job. All right, directory information. Yes, and, and thank you for mentioning the food service workers, because I, I always tell bus drivers and food service workers, even though the bus drivers are not direct employees of the school district and um, <coughs> food service workers are, they're sort of the unsung heroes. Uh, because they are absolutely vital to making a successful school day and a successful school year. Well, the matter of directory information. Um, this is um, information regarding students, such as name and address, field of study, uh, previous school attended, uh, date and place of birth, uh, information that I've outlined on, on my memo to you that uh, was originally articulated in the Family Education Rights Privacy Act, which was passed, a federal statute passed in 1974, and reiterated through the New Hampshire RSA 189, uh, Section 1E, uh, which states that a local education agency which maintains education records may provide information designated as directory information consistent with the Family Education Rights Privacy Act, some of you may have known and know, may know it as FERPA. And each year, schools shall give parents public notice of the types of information designated as directory information. Um, when I first started here, I noticed that that notification had not been going home to parents. So in the last two to three years, it has gone home. Um, what types of information or what types of companies or agencies might ask for information? Well. Could be vendors, 
selling uh, school-related items, school rings, photos, uh, could be educational tutoring services, um, college recruiters, military recruiters. Uh, sometimes we get public records requests. And so what FERPA and uh, the New Hampshire uh, statute allows is for parents to decline the, uh, the extension of this information to anyone who inquires. And so that's the reason that the the notice is sent out, it went out last week to parents uh, from my office. And we've already had um, probably a half dozen uh, parents who have notified us that they do not want their uh, children's um, information disclosed. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, that is a personal preference, a private family uh, preference. Um, and so what I'd like the, the parents to know once again is this is a statutory requirement that uh, this type of information is able to be disclosed to third parties uh, unless a parent says, no, I do not want my child's information disclosed. And um, that's in accordance with the FERPA statute at the federal level and the RSA 189-1E in uh, New Hampshire. So uh, next year and every other year, this notice will be going out. You'll receive this same memo, and um, uh, there were more questions, I would have to say, last year than this year, because I think uh, we answered a lot of questions by email last year from parents who had uh, an inquiry of, well, who might be requesting this information? And that's why I wanted to give you a little, a little uh, idea of the types of agencies or companies that, that might be asking for information. <coughs> I want to add one thing to what you said, Bill, and I appreciate the explanation. Um, I had some inquiries about, well, why is this not an opt-in? Why is it an opt-out? And um, I just want to read a portion of the statute. It says, by a specified time after parents are notified of their review rights, parents shall request in writing to remove all or part of the information on their child that they do not wish to be available to the public. Such approval shall be renewed on an annual basis. It is not the district who has set this up as an opt-out policy. It is the state of New Hampshire in RSA 189, Section 1E. Um, I am absolutely in favor of the public being involved with our state legislators. If people want that changed, the appropriate place to take those concerns is to our legislative body, which is our state representatives and our state senator to address whether this should be opt-in or opt-out. The district's hands are tied of it being an opt-out policy. Any other questions or comments? Okay, student enrollments. Our enrollment uh, to this point in the year uh, mid-September, this is not the official October 1st enrollment, but I want to give you a snapshot right now of where we are. Uh, we are about 64 students uh, less than we had last year in our school district um, and grades pre-K through four. We are down by 28 students. Grades five and six were actually up by 26 students over last year. Grades seven and eight were 30 students lower than last year. High school, 32 students uh, lower. Uh, our out-of-district placements are up by two and our homeschool numbers are up by uh, 10 students. That's a parent uh, preference, as you know. Um, in terms of the individual schools, uh, Master Cola uh, has 22 fewer students than last year. Uh, Reeds Ferry has 18 more students than last year. Uh, Thornton's Ferry has 24 fewer students than last year. Uh, the upper elementary has 26 more students than last year. The middle school, 30 fewer students and the high school, 32 fewer students, for a total, a net total of 64 uh, fewer students this year. Um, you know, the intrigue of, of demographics is you never quite know what it's going to look like from, from year to year. Uh, sometimes uh, people who are very attuned to uh, the budget process uh, will say, well, your numbers are down uh, in this particular grade, in this particular school, so you can cut a teacher. The important thing when you look at making any staff cuts is you have to look two or three years out 
because there may be anomalies in enrollments where it may be particularly low one year or particularly high uh, the, uh, that one year, but you look at the trend, what's, what's going to follow, okay? And um, so you don't want to make any uh, illogical, precipitous decisions that may come back to haunt you. So you look at it very carefully in terms of two and three years out into the future. And uh, basically, you apply, uh, Matt and I do this every year, we apply sort of a seven-year average of the cohort survival ratio. How many students in grade one progress to stay to grade two? How many in grade two progress to grade three? And we try to develop a profile. Uh, now, that profile is not only for students who are currently in school, but from birth to kindergarten. What does that <coughs> cohort survival ratio? That's generally greater than one, about 1.25. In other words, for every 100 children born five years previously, on average, about 125 students show up in, in kindergarten. Um, now, that can change also um, based on marriage rates, on uh, based on the number of, of women in, in peak childbearing years, and uh, you know social norms, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating area to analyze. Uh, what we found over the years also is that um, when there are new developments in a community, very few parents move in who have students in preschool and kindergarten. They're still in primarily starter homes, and it's when they get into the third, fourth, and fifth, and sometimes the sixth grade that a family will move to a new community. And that's what I've seen over many years is that it's that upper elementary range uh, in terms of uh, age and grade level when families decide to move. So we'll keep an eye on, on enrollments. Uh, it's always interesting to present you the figures. Um, you know, one direct effect is the number of residential units built in a community. We're one of the, if not the fastest growing community in all of New Hampshire. And the other is the secondary effect of senior citizens, empty nesters who will move out of their existing homes into perhaps a less intense, maintenance intense environment and their homes are occupied by young families with Hot Wheels and swing sets and we all know the rest. So uh, we'll continue to present you, uh, certainly during the um, budget process, we'll present you with a, as much enrollment and demographic data as, as we can. Comments, Lori. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to say, um, you know, Merrimack is the eighth largest town in New Hampshire, and um, I was just talking to Finley recently because Paul McCallie just put out that Merrimack is one of the fastest growing towns in New Hampshire, one of the top three mm -hmm. fastest growing towns. So we just haven't caught up with these these th these numbers, and so I appreciate you say go cautious because um, you know people moving to town might. Um, be moving into the apartments, et cetera, but it doesn't mean they're not going to get married and have children and mm -hmm. stay in this town, so. Yeah, good point. Any other comments or questions? I did have one question, and I don't know if this is something you have um, readily available. Of the increase of 10 homeschool families, are those all that left the district or some of those that like now have a kindergartner and they've notified the district that they're homeschooling? Um, I can speak to that. Yeah. It's a little bit of both, and I work with Sandy on this. We've also had some really unique situations where um, maybe you have an 18-year-old that's not quite at graduation rate, and they want to go to the CTE program and continue, but they've been doing homeschool, and they've moved in with a relative. It's a, it's a combination of both of those things. Um, some are families, and so they reach out to us and add an additional school-aged child. Um, and it's tricky when I look at this, I always talk with Sandy about, um, we, we are able to f reach out to other families. You know, we know about our out-of-district students, we know about the kids that are enrolled, but once a family notifies us that they're homeschooling their student, they never have to notify us again. <laughs> And it's intermittent and inconsistent, honestly, if people tell us that they've moved away. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So I worry a little bit about that number. It, 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 it's how many notifications we have on file for the students that would be here. But the accuracy, if you said, are all of these families still living here? I, I, I couldn't tell you. Just because of the way the notification, um, the state statute, they just have to notify us or um, the commissioner and the commissioner doesn't have 
to inform us. So it's, it is a strange uh, gray area. So I hope that answers your question. Probably gave you more. It did. I have a lot of questions about no, it. No, it yep. did. And I, and I understand that because when my daughter was at a Christian school and then she wanted to homeschool, we, we used a different Christian school as our reporting agency. And we lived here in Merrimack, but we never communicated with the Merrimack district because we had a different school that was overseeing her standardized testing and, and all of that. So I totally understand that. <laughs> all right. Let's go to the school board goals. So I'm going to move up there. And we will, as I do the PowerPoint, feel free to jump in. I use a Mac. Who's the PC person that you tell them? Slideshow? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a Mac girl. All right, so tonight we're going to um, share a PowerPoint with the public about our school board goals that we set. We met on June 20th, and uh, we started with our mission statement. So I'm going to read the mission statement for the district. The Merrimack School District will provide a high quality, future driven education to all students in the community. Students will engage in learning opportunities that reflect, reflect both rigor and relevance, along with the meeting their cognitive, social, and emotional needs. The district will prepare students to understand, adapt, and adjust to civic, economic, social, and technological challenges in the world. Our overall goal is to inspire, create, and encourage students to be curious, connected, prepared, resilient, dedicated individuals that are lifelong expert learners. Merrimack graduates exercise judgment, are innovative, and become responsible, contributing members of society. This mission statement guides not only the strategic plan, but all the goals that the school board has set. When we met on June 20th, we reviewed our 2023-2024 goals. I'll briefly go through those. Create an engaged, inclusive, and collaborative district culture built on mutual trust and respect. This goal was a continuation from the 22-23, and it is an ongoing culture uh, part of everything that we do. So we have not included that as a goal because we feel like we have met the goal and have put that as part of our culture. Number two, the pathways to graduation. Again, it was a further developed goal from the previous year and um, the board and the administration. The high school has done a lot of work to achieve those. Improve our learning outcomes by ensuring our instruction is responsive to the varied needs of our student population. Again, it was an ongoing goal and now it is a continuation of our curriculum culture. Have facilities and equipment that are safe, secure, clean, healthy, current, and appropriate for meeting the educational needs of students and staff. Matt has worked really hard with our facilities team and administration, especially getting grants for security protocols and things like that to meet this goal. Finally, create dynamic relationships between the school district and community through clear and consistent communication, and we have put that goal in for 24-25. So that's our first goal. Create a dynamic relationship between the district and community through clear and consistent communication. And our objectives for reaching that goal include aligning and streamlining, promulgating communication pathways within the district to parents and staff. As we know, there are a multitude of digital media ways to communicate, but it also requires each school board member to be personally communicating with our circles of influence. We also want to research hiring a communication specialist to assess, strategize, and implement a comprehensive communication plan for the district. I have already apologized to Bill, Amy, and Matt because I am right in the middle of a strate uh, strategic stakeholders engagement class, which is all about putting together a public relations communication plan. And so I met with Bill and Matt this past week. Amy was up at the DOE, so she got to miss all our fun but discussing um, advancing that goal some more and some potential work sessions with the school board as we move forward 
uh, Bill and Matt will be gathering some very important information for us as we move forward on that goal or that strategic objective. Establish guidelines for effective presentations for committees, board, me board meetings, and public meetings, including the deliberative session. And provide engaging opportunities for stakeholders to understand the guiding principles of budget development. And we are on the cusp of doing that, are we not, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> Our second goal is related to student services. Provide responsive programs, instruction, and systems of support that engage all students with opportunities and pathways that effectively meet their needs, support academic, so social, and emotional growth, and enable the pursuit of individual passions and interests. So while we have student services, which includes primarily our special education programming and our SEL programming and our student wellness programming, this goal encompasses even a little bit more than that. We are looking at every student and how we are helping them enable their individual passions and interests. But to specifically relate to student services and this goal, we are reviewing all of the following items. Special education access, sorry, access, inclusion, and communication. We'll be looking at our ESOL, Title I, 504, and homeless access and supports. By the way, for our Merrimack community, we do have an increasing number of our multi-language learners and students who are experiencing housing insecurity here in Merrimack. And they are two uh, stakeholder groups that a lot of times we don't see as we go about our everyday lives, but they are a very important constituency in our community. We also will be reviewing our supports for at-risk students and we are also going to look at our supports for our confident learners. So as many know, we eliminated some programs last year due to budgetary constraints, but we wanted to expand the reach of some of our enrichment programs to reach more of our confident learners than we were previously able to reach within the confines of our specific programming. Our third goal is related to the Merrimack High School. We will collaborate with the high school administration and staff on a study with the goal of outlining the resources needed to make Merrimack High School a flagship school of New Hampshire. We know that every school district in the state, everyone looks to the high school, even if you don't have high school kids. And yet the high school is the flagship school in the district and we want to make MHS a flagship school in New Hampshire because we know that the opportunities at MHS are outstanding and the students are just incredible. So some of the strategic obje objectives to meet that goal include assessing what is working well, current practices, and identify the resources needed to ensure continued growth. Increase instructional opportunities, improve graduation rates, which we've already been seeing through our expanded extended learning opportunities and our pathways to graduation, but we wanna, we wanna get that rate to zero. Expand diverse pathways to graduation, Catch those who are failing or high risk of failing and at risk of not graduating long before that happens. Expand our ELOs and our innovative learning opportunities as well. And ensure all students are college, career, and future ready. So we know that not every kid is gonna go to college. Not every student graduates knowing exactly what they want to do the day after graduation, but we want them to be thinking about their future and prepared to start making those decisions when they leave Merrimack. Our next vision is related to our mission and vision. Ensure that the district's mission and vision of a graduate become the central frameworks for our collective work across the district. So we have a vision of a learner that was a very important and critical piece to the strategic plan, but the vision of the graduate is kind of the goal every educator and every lesson plan is aiming for. And so we wanna make sure that we are constantly reminding everyone in the district what our framework is and ensuring that all of our curriculum and our extracurriculars and all of our activities are working towards that mission and vision of a graduate. Some of the ways we'll be doing that will be to have staff, students, parents, and community members become familiar with the meaning and value of these statements. So we wanna communicate clearly the mission of the district. We will consistently ask ourselves when discussing any new initiative or an educational issue, how does this activity project, idea, whatever it is, linked to our mission and our portrait of a graduate. As all of us know, there are a lot of tech ed companies out there that have products and programs and they're trying to get new customers. 
we can't take every program that comes our way, no matter how fascinating the bells and whistles look. Same with curriculum. Our mission statement and the strategic plan are the, the guardrails for every decision that we make as a board in policy, as an administration in administering the district. Does it link with our vision and mission and our portrait of a graduate? Lastly, our final goal, goal is an important building need. This goal states that we will work with the community to communicate the importance of building a new, multifunctional, welcoming, and accessible SAU unit. We will reach out to the community to better understand their concerns around this initiative while simultaneously communicating how an improvement in this area would positively impact meetings with the parents, hiring new staff, and conducting the important business of the district. We have already started that process with the great work from the Planning and Building Committee. They have already overseen the fire marshal's report, the ADA non-compliance issues, and the expenses we reported at the last board meeting, what it would cost to rehab the two buildings that we have, and decided that that was not a feasible or efficient or good use of finances to move forward on that. That does not mean the work is done. Nothing is done, as Lori knows, being a member of that committee. Uh, there's still much more work to be done. That plan also did not include any opportunity of expanding square footage to house the multitude of um, employees that really need to be in a central location that are scattered throughout the district. And that was another reason why it wasn't feasible according to planning and building. So we have wor our work to communicate those things continually to the community and receive their concerns. Planning and building committee has talked about having an ad hoc committee of members in the public to work alongside with them, to be connectors between planning and building, the school board, and the community to help uh, give information and receive feedback from the community. So at the last meeting, we, had, we presented the strategic plan. All the school board goals, which are for this year, align with that three-year strategic plan. There is no uh, school board goal that's outside that. We used that strategic plan in our goal setting and they uh, dovetail together perfectly. The school board will also be presenting updates regularly as to where we are in our goals, and administration will be providing updates on the strategic plan goals as we've laid out in that grid. Some of them will be um, accomplished this year or next year or the next year, but there will be regular updates on both the school board goals and the strategic plan goals. And as always, the school board welcomes feedback from the community regarding these specific goals or the strategic plan. Uh, we, we would love to have conversations. It, it is so much better if we can sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk one-on-one -on -one with people about these goals and be able to explain where they're coming from and hear from members of the community what they think about these goals. So we are welcome to that. And with that, I'm going to open up comments to the board. I have a couple. Um, so the first thing on the mission statement, um, I would love, you know, as um, before a meeting or whatever, the mission statement can be on the Merrimack TV so people can read our mission statement. I also think it would be nice if the mission statement I just don't know where we would put it at our current SAU, but if we could even put it on the wall here, so it's, it's a reminder of what our mission is for, for everybody who comes to a school board meeting, uh, anyone who comes into central office. I, I just don't know if there's a wall space for it, but that would be a, a nice thing so everyone can see the amount of work and time we put into creating that mission statement, creating these goals, and then aligning these goals. Um, I think it's just been a, a wonderful process, and, and I really have enjoyed the last two years of having that vision, having those goals, and then in April and May going through and finding how successful we've been and where we need to continue a goal. Um, so I guess that's it. Naomi. Um, it was a great presentation that was those were the things we talked about those were the things we decided about as a group that was like everyone in that room was on the same page with with where we are and where we needed to go one of the things um 
I kind of wanted to expand on from your presentation. I thought about interrupting you, but I figured it was easier to do it this way. Is when you were going over the goals from last year, uh, especially the the culture one and the curriculum one. One of the things we talked about in that goal setting meeting w- when we were evaluating those goals was when where is the line between I've met my goal doesn't mean I'm resting on my laurels and we're done with this and we're never looking at it at it again. But where is the line between, you know, we're looking at this thing and we're some of our sort of some of our goals around it are, you know, we're going to do this every six months and we're going to do that every six months. And it, it sort of moves into the territory of this is part of our daily routine. It's part of our, our our cycle of things that we're doing all the time. And so it's not that those things are no longer goals and no longer priorities. It's that they have become you said it, they've become sort of the the culture of how we're how we're doing things and we decided that between some of it being represented in other ways in the strategic plan and between some of it just being sort of ongoing work that it's moved from a this is a new thing that we're trying to do to ongoing work and i felt like that was an important clarification um i I think lori did a really nice job of, of kind of outlying or uh, giving the overview of uh, our discussion that day and, and you know where we've been and where we're going. And I agree with Lori. I think that mission statement should be printed on just about everything we send home. Uh, and <clears throat> um, you know, finding a place for that to be prominent, I think, is really, really important because if we believe in that, we need to let, you know, I always tell my students, if we don't care, they won't care. So like if we, we need to make that front and center. Um, but yeah, really nice job. Naomi. It's funny. This is, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when we talk about the the handbooks, I was going to suggest that we have the mission statement in the handbooks. <laughs> Lori. Going back, so the ad hoc committee, actually, um, the planning and building committee doesn't um, appoint that or ask for volunteers. The school board does. That's just one, just one clarification. So we might want to put that on next, you know, our next agenda so we can get that ad hoc committee together. But great job. Well, and I just want to say that um, Bill brought in a fabulous facilitator. We had great discussion that day. It was the shortest all-day meeting I think I have ever been in. This is an amazing team to work with, and um, we had a number of other really important district staff there. And the conversations were honest. The conversations were very open and um, but everybody has the same goal. And so the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of unity is there without having uniformity. And so I look forward to this meeting every single year. And I want to thank Lori Rothhouse because she was the uh, impetus for us having these meetings in the first place when she served as chair of this board. And again, it was new and now is part of our DNA. It's just something we do every year. So I appreciate that. Okay, revised service learning project. Well, a couple of uh, years ago, I began to have some conversations with our staff, with our leadership team, uh, asking what is this thing known as the service learning project (laughs) for which there is a sum of money budgeted in the collective bargaining agreement. And um, there were a set of guidelines that were drafted. Um, I, I, I couldn't figure out what it was saying, quite honestly. And I thought it was overly complicated. And it was one of those programs that has, has provided great benefit to the school district, but has strayed a little bit from its original intent. And so about a year and a half ago, I mentioned to... Uh, you know, Amy and Matt and Melissa and our leadership team and and uh, the union leadership that I wanted to to use a, a very unsophisticated term. I wanted to blow blow up the existing SLP program and let's start over. Um, it was sort of straying away from its original intent, and we were beginning to fund an increasing number of activities that I consider co-curricular in nature, which is not the intent. The intent of the program, as it indicates in the collective bargaining agreement, 
is to allow individual certified teachers to receive training to meet the needs of the school district as determined by the superintendent or the designee. And so we, uh, we began to put together some guidelines and uh, some criteria, uh, restructure the program with the intent of supporting the instructional program, addressing uh, the school board goals, and assist in the accomplishment of one or more initiatives in the district's strategic plan, and also represent evidence-based educational best practices. We have refocused it on activities such as professional learning teams, uh, mentor, mentor program, mm -hmm. uh, domestic overnight field trips, international field trips, uh, qualify, uh, development of innovative content, lessons, innovative instructional practice. This is where we'd like to really see some creativity expressed by the, by the staff. Um, you know, learning, as we all know, and we all subscribe to, doesn't need to look like it did 50 years ago. It can't. And so we want to encourage as much innovative practice and thought as possible. We want to continue to encourage the celebrations of learning with the understanding that sometimes small activities help you gain a little bit of momentum, which turns into a lot of momentum. Um, and so we, we like to make certainly large-scale celebrations, but also smaller-scale celebrations. Uh, we want to continue to encourage the homework club and student support services beyond the contracted workday. Okay, this is beyond what a teacher might routinely do and say, well, I'll stay for 35 or 45, or 30 or 45 minutes after school for extra help. This goes beyond that. Uh, a book study, in fact, we have an inquiry today about uh, staff of a particular school that want to engage in a uh, book study. But we're going to require um, a report on that that can be shared with not only the staff of that school, but the staff across the school district. We want to raise the level of, uh, of training and of information for all of our staff. Uh, we, we want to encourage teachers to develop um, collaborative uh, professional development sessions that build on professionalism, build pedagogical skills, build content skills. Um, in fact, I was just at a, um, just as an aside, at a regional superintendent's meeting last, uh, last Friday, and I proposed to the other superintendents in the South Central District, which is our district, that we compare our 25-26, 2025-2026 school calendars with our professional development days in case we want to come up with some collaborative efforts between school systems that may be focused on literacy or math or science or innovative practices. Uh, professionals from different communities sharing information with each other. So we'll keep you informed of that. We'll see if we can get that, get that to work. Uh, we want to try and develop in collaboration with a college or university, and this may may have been done here uh, in the past, uh, courses that our own staff run, and they're compensated for that, uh, f and staff take those courses for graduate credit, uh, sort of a University of Merrimack, where we determine what are our needs, what are the needs of students, and what types of professional development courses might we want to run to enhance the skill set, the pedagogical skills, et cetera, of our staff. So. Uh, we've come up, and I want to thank Amy and Matt and Melissa in working with me to, uh, and, and also union leadership, Reggie, Josh, and Don, uh, for meeting with us. Uh, we've come up with some stipend levels, uh, four tiers of, uh, of stipends. We have a application form, that, uh, and those have already been uh, coming in. Uh, this is a very popular program, but just know that it's, it's going to be focused more on teaching, learning, professional development, everything that is related to growth and development of students, and growth and development of staff. Co-curriculars will be funded out of the co-curricular budget. So those activities that have been of a co-curricular nature for whom a stipend or for which a stipend has come out of this source of funds, it will come out of the an appropriate co-curricular account in the budget. So um, we think it will work. We think it will work well. I uh, want to thank the union for understanding and recognizing that uh, the program was going a little bit far afield 
and we need to bring it back to the original focus and um, really put a lot of fidelity uh, into the program. Questions from the board? Lori. I just, I want to applaud you for the administration from taking a past practice, reviewing it, making, you know, recommendations to improve it. You know, this um, actually started when I was there, but this seems to be a, a more balanced approach and a more fair approach. So thank you for that. And um, I'm, I'm totally in support of the new service learning project guidelines. Um, I do have a question on the um, teaching a Merrimack specific course. Would that be like something that would be CEU oriented or? Uh, I'm sorry. What, what? So if as the development of the University of Merrimack mm -hmm. courses, yep. would those be part of a teacher's um, CEUs as if they participated in those kinds of things? That's, that would be the plan. Yes. That's great. Uh, and, um, you know, could be and is where, you know, we'd, we'd look to Amy for a lot of advice in terms of well, from her perspective. Um, what might be uh, a course that would be extraordinarily helpful to our staff in meeting the needs of not only the current, but what we uh, understand to be the emerging needs of students? I used to write those kind of things, and I, th I, th I think they are s you have high t teacher participation and mm. high impact because it's so tailored to the needs of this district, this school, these students, and drafting like the syllabus and putting everything together makes it clear what the teachers need to do for a course like that and so i think that is an excellent excellent idea yeah you know the the, the dufours for years would used to write on um, uh, that the most valuable professional development was internally driven now naturally you would need some expert advice from, from people outside the organization but people have a vested interest in growth and development, and so that's what we're trying to take advantage of. It'll take a little bit of work to get this off the ground, but we intend to get it off the ground. Do uh, I have a motion to accept? Oh, well, just sorry. Real, Go no, ahead, just Ken. a quick anecdote. Uh, we have that very program at my school that you're talking about. We went at Cunnett University, and it's always like it sells out. Like yeah. these teachers create super interesting programs that are, are really – specific to our school and um th it's like standing room only for those things so it's it, i am 100 percent on board sure i'll make the motion i'll make the motion to accept the new service learning project guidelines as written i'll second moved by ken seconded by Lori. all those in favor say aye aye four zero zero all right thank you Approval of the MES, RFS, TFS, and JMU's handbooks. By the way, I did talk to Bill and Sandy, and we're breaking these up across different meetings because uh, just legal opinions have to be given on new updates and things like that, and so it was easier to tackle the elementary schools first before we tackle middle school and high school. Well, once again, we... Um, whoops, excuse me. Once again, we had them reviewed by legal counsel for any federal or state... Uh, statutory changes. Um, the one change, certainly, that we uh, needed to make was Title IX, the new regulations, and so that ha that has been incorporated into the all into all handbooks. Um, we think they look certainly more professional than what they used to look like years and years past. Um, and the content, for the most part, is everything that is essential for students and parents to know. Um, these, um, you know, what's intriguing to me is um, a student and parent handbook is one of the most important documents that a school district produces every year. When I arrived here and started work, uh, there had been no changes made in about eight years. Mm -hmm. And so we make very certain right now that our legal team reviews these every single year for either any new federal or state statutes. Um, and that's what they've done. So they're up to date and they're ready to go and uh, we'll have the middle school and the high school at the next uh, next meeting. Lori. A couple of things. So I, I totally agree. I've been um, talking about student handbooks for four years. <laughs> so, um, you know, I really appreciate this work and uh, I hope next year um, the the uh, team can start working on them in the summer so we can get these out. 
um, in August because you know the, the the statement before the cement dries right before the cement dries you want to make sure everybody knows the rules but I know how much effort it took for this year so I'm happy it's September and and we're getting them and then for me I just have you know this is kind of a personal thing and I do think it's linked to the mission um, climate and culture etc but when we look at celebration guidelines um, what I what I would hope is that all of our elementary schools would be on the same page when it comes to celebrations and right now uh, it that's not the case and so you have two elementary schools that allow celebrations with food uh, for for children's birthday which I'm totally um, on board with that and then we have one that they don't have that opportunity um, so on page seven when we talk about celebration guidelines it says focus on non-food ways to celebrate I I would really like to say look for ways to have non-food ways to celebrate or consider that but also understand that for children in schools and even in high school when I was a principal and they did advisories kids brought cupcakes and, and you can have healthy cupcakes but they brought things to celebrate food is a part of our culture as Americans and so I would like to see us be consistent in all three elementary schools and consider that we are able to have birthdays celebrated in in the one school that they they're not allowed to can you respond to that as a parent with the child in the one school where they don't do it it's a huge load off to not have to send something to school for my kid with for her birthday and not have to hear about it. Oh, so and so brought in this and so and so brought in that and me having to go, well crap, now what I'm going what am I going to do? What they do at Thornton's for birthdays is on your birthday, you get a special announcement in the morning and then you get to go down to the office and get a goodie bag. And I'm sure the individual teachers do something, but as a lazy parent who doesn't like to do stuff like that, it's a relief to not have it be part of the culture with, with the sending stuff in. Um, so a counter um, perspective, I'm sure there are people who agree with me and I'm sure there are people who agree with you out in the community, but I, that was my gut reaction to that was, no, please don't go back. So, so what I wanna say with, you know, as a mom of three children that all went through the school district and then having children that go to uh, two different. I have grandchildren go to two different schools. So, when um, my daughter's children are getting ready for their birthdays, she's doing that prep mm -hmm. work. And then my son's children, they they really feel uh, like why doesn't my school? And so it does cause something because they, they they the children spend a lot of time at my daughter's house. And so uh, it does like why is our school? not celebrating i do agree with you about the consistent piece whatever it is it should be consistent across all three schools bill I think, oh, Ken. I think, okay. oh so um my understanding um dealing with kids and birthdays and things like that um you know kind of going back to we were looking at numbers and demographics what amy was talking about and i i think part of the driving um considerations when this decision was made i believe um you know, we have kids and families that deal with food scarcity yeah. and kids that, you know, these can turn into a keeping up with the Joneses kind of mentality when you have like, oh, well, so-and-so brought in like three large pizzas and like all this stuff. And, and now if I'm a family that's struggling paycheck to paycheck, now I got to consider uh, the meals I have to bring in. And then not to mention kids with food allergies, you have to have an alternative option for them. Um, and it can get to be a lot. And I certainly understand that wanting to celebrate these things, but I, I, I see both sides. I see the families that might make that decision of, um, you know, it, I, I don't have the money in our checking account this week to spend 40 to $50 on snacks and food for my kids you know, 25 kids in the classroom. Uh, so I can, I can see why, and again, as um, I'm married and my child, uh, my wife and my child both have summer birthdays. <laughs> so like students who don't celebrate during the school year are left out. So I do think there are, are, you know, if your birthday is from September to June and your family can afford it, I think it's great. Uh, but there's a decent amount of families that don't fall into those categories. So that's why I think probably some of these considerations are brought up. So. Two things, based on what you said. I, I agree. I see both sides of it. And I, and I think the language is good. You know, you can consider it as a compliment. It's making it optional that I think what Lori is talking about. 
at the one school, making it optional where it's already optional at the other schools. Um, second of all, teachers should be doing half birthdays because I got summer kid birthdays August and July. And so um, their teachers always did their half birthday. So if you're a teacher out there and you've got kids with summer birthdays, please do their half birthdays or something. Make sure the summer kids get their birthday celebrated. Um, Bill, you had something you wanted to say, so I'd like to hear that. Well, I, I wasn't necessarily going to say uh, anything about this other than the fact that we always talk in the leadership team about being consistent uh, with everything we do. So let me see how I can massage this a little bit. And I will add in all of our handbooks the mission statement, okay, which we talked about previously. Okay. I have some other comments that I was going to make about the handbooks in particular, yes. if this is the right time mm -hmm. to do that. I was going to do the food thing one more time. One oh, more thing. Go Let's do that. and then. So maybe. going to, to Ken's point on the food thing one more time, like, so in the news recently, we all know about a school district that uh, was taking legal action about student lunches. And we would, you know, these students haven't um, paid their student lunches, so we're going to take them to court. And um, so for at least the years I've been on the school board, and, and Ken and I talked about this a lot, I was really thinking we need to put a small committee together to do something called a Sunshine Committee. And the Sunshine Committee would be, uh, you know, we would fundraise, we could work with Fidelity. When someone passed away, like when I passed away, I would leave my estate to the Sunshine Committee, and then if there was a situation where a teacher knew like, hey, this student needs new sneakers or this student needs to, like we're gonna celebrate their birthday because we're, we have this money in this fund that we can apply to and so we can, we can create that. And, and I think it's something that I would definitely um, be on board with and, and that way we could solve some of that issues because we don't want anybody to feel um, mm. like they're, they don't have enough. Yeah, re regarding that, we have had anonymous donations in the past, um, and we have accepted those, and we have applied those accordingly. Just to, well, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I, I just know we would never do that, and I'm so proud that we would never. You know, take you've you've got your free and reduced families, right? Right. And sometimes they get in a bind, and then you've got other people who don't qualify for free and reduced. I mean, the, the, the threshold for that family of four can't make over like 50 grand a year. Mm -hmm. But then again, you can make 300 grand a year for a family of four and you can get your educational freedom account for 5,000 bucks from the state of New Hampshire, which is, I think it's our money, right? <laughs> right? It's our money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, there are times where people who don't qualify, they get in a bind, stuff happens, somebody loses their job, there's medical bills, there's something like that. We get it. And so when we get those generous donations, we have brought a few before the board, and they're anonymous in nature, and we apply them to everybody's account. First we hit those who are on free and reduced to take care of them, and then we go and we spread it amongst everybody else. And it's the right thing to do. If somebody's going to give you a donation to take care of a lunch balance from a family, you got to say yes. <laughs> it's the humane thing to do, and it's the right thing to do. Correct. This is totally off topic, but I would just like to address that one thing. I mean, this is my fourth year on the board. I've never seen Matt come to us with this being a problem, but I would assume you would come to us if there was like a serious in the red, like a total Absolutely. in the red. Absolutely. But I agree with you. We would look for every way to solve that problem yep. before going to court. No. no. All right. Naomi, different, <laughs> different topic. Sorry. That was my soapbox for the evening. All right, it's all I'm, good. I'm it's all good. Um, so handbooks. Um, I wanted to say Thank you to who, 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 everyone who was involved in updating these because I remember reading them a year or two ago and, and they are vastly improved from, from what they were the first time I read them and I'm, I'm really thrilled. Um, my one comment was add the, the mission and I actually what I was also thinking the vision of a learner because there's a, the f very first bar is like something about, um, let me see what page it was on. Three, on page three, it's just a little 
sentence of the that we're in the process of creating a vision of a learner and here's the vision of a learner website and I was thinking we have that beautiful graphic of the vision of the learner like that should be in there and I don't know if the portrait of the graduate is appropriate for the elementary school um, handbooks but I would love to see like the, all those title pages and then the mission and then the vision of the learner and then the portrait of a graduate and then all of the stuff in the um, in the thing one of the things that's new is I loved the links to the policies in the little mm -hmm. so you've got the like the little snapshot with the very readable understandable text and then the links back to the full policy for the people who wanted them I thought that was great um, I was curious are all three of the lower elementary schools using school dismissal manager because that was mentioned as a way to report absences yeah I believe so I only know about Thornton's because that's where my kid goes mm -hmm. so. yeah I think I think Jay yeah. Muse is uh, getting on board too so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um, and then the one thing I noticed, and I don't know if it's because, um, because the busing is an outside contractor, but there wasn't anything really about, there was stuff about arrival and when to get there, um, but there wasn't anything about transportation, um, like bus routes, where are bus routes posted, when will bus routes be published, and I, I understand that that's a little bit of a process every year, too, because it's kind of a race to the finish line with mm -hmm. knowing who's registered and where they're living and, and arranging the bus routes and everything. So I didn't know if that was something that... But bus uh, routes are posted before the beginning of school. Right, but but yeah. there's nothing in the handbook about here's where you oh, find the yeah. bus routes. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. all right. We can, we can address that. And um, this is my personal bias, but I would love to see under some sort of transportation section, something encouraging parents to put their kids on the bus. Um, because those car oh, lines right. get long. And honestly, in inclement weather, the buses are safer than cars. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they are. They're, they're 100%. They're less likely to get into an accident because they're heavier. And when they do get into an accident, which almost never happens, um, they always they're, win. Because they're they so big? Win. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, in yeah. bl completely blunt terms, yes, they do. Um, and uh, so I, I know some people have concerns about buses. I know some people, but, but speaking as a bus driver in Merrimack, we have amazing professional drivers who do great work. And I really strongly recommend that folks take the bus if they can. <laughs> Any other comments or questions about the handbooks? Uh, may I just say, um, I have to thank Sandy Swanson for the extraordinary amount of work that she devotes every year to the uh, handbooks at, at all levels. I mean, I think she goes through about three bottles of Tylenol by the time she's finished working on it because she is just working on them constantly. And, Lori, you're absolutely right. We've, we've had this conversation about three weeks ago that we're, we've got to start this earlier so that these are ready to go at the beginning of the school year, very beginning of the school year. Just Ken. a couple of quick questions um, that I just thought of. Um, is there a plan to like distribute physical copies of these or is this purely a digital format? Well, for the most part it's been digital, but we're gonna have some hard copies also for any parent that wants to pick one up at their school. One thing, um, not that we do everything right, because we don't, but one thing that uh, our district does is there's an actual contract in the back of our handbooks, because we give every family a physical, uh, no, I take that back, we went digital this year, but we give them a physical contract that yeah. says basically, I have read mm -hmm. the handbook, right. and um, it's, it's proven to be super effective, so um, I just like that, that's all. I like that too, because it's a form of accountability for both the district and the families that and, and frankly, it makes it easier to parent because you could say to your kid, mm -hmm. you read that, we sat down and read this, you know this is what it says, you know, and so don't tell me otherwise. Naomi. Having just filled out the power school registration for my children, there actually is um, a link to the handbook and you have to like initial a little box or you click, click it box. or something yeah, that good. says, right. yes, I read yeah, the, the parent handbook. So it, it does exist. Mm. Good. Lori. So I always, um, I've said this before, but like, you know, when we're, because communication is something that we are focusing on. And there's really like two types of communication. And so 
one type is we want to make sure we push out so people understand this before they need to understand it and then obviously there's the you know communication like oh what was the policy on dress code so then they would go and look but if we could push out the communication first so people would have a, a better understanding of what the expectations are I think it helps all of us all right do I have a motion to accept the handbooks with those changes or do I have a motion I'll make a motion to accept those handbooks with those changes all right do I have a second second all those in favor say aye. Aye. I'm going to say aye. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't like that word. <laughs> well, he, he was going to yeah, he's gonna massage, massage that. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. aye. Mm -hmm. Four zero zero. Okay. Thank you. Any other new business? I have one. All right. <coughs> Lori. I actually have two. Um, so, St. Anselm's College just recently is offering free tuition to New Hampshire students who are going to be freshmen next year and um, there are some requirements like you have to family income has to be under a hundred thousand dollars a year you have to have a certain GPA I think it's like a three two um, and um, they're doing it because they want more New Hampshire students to think about and consider St. Anselm's College which is it's a wonderful school um, so I think that would be um, something that we really need to get out to the word out can I add to that Along with that, it's for all four years. There was some confusion I noticed the other day. Was it just for the first year? But it's for all four years if you get it. If you meet the requirements each year, typical of most scholarships. Okay. And then for new business next time, if we could also uh, consider offering people to um, help form a committee for Fidelity for the Sunshine Fund to um, be able to get money um, to support our needy students um, I would love to be on that committee and I would love to do that work I will add that to the agenda any other new business second review of field trip and excursion policy I'm going to turn this over to Bill um, I just want to make note that um, I'm awaiting some language from the high school staff the administration about students who take the bus but who want to leave with either a friend or um, uh, a parent. And so I'm waiting that. That should be in before the end of this week, and I'll send that on to you. We'll incorporate that for the hopefully the final reading of this policy. Any other comments on the policy that we need to make administration aware of? Okay. Approval of the minutes. Now, we have the public minutes in our packets. If you would like to table the um, public minutes, we can do that. If you would not have time to refresh, re read through them as they were on our, our desk, I am um, open to entertain what the board would like to do on the public minutes. I think we can approve them, and then if next meeting, if someone has something, we can go back. But usually, they're pretty okay. accurate. I, I Sandy emailed them too, and I read them, so yeah. I didn't. I didn't catch anything. If Naomi didn't catch anything, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> now we're all sad for yeah. sure. <laughs> then I will accept no a motion. Pressure. You I'll, make a motion. <laughs> I'll accept. Uh, is I will entertain a motion for the public and non-public minutes of September 9th, twenty twenty four. I move that we accept the public and non-public minutes from September 9th, twenty twenty four. And I'll second that. Motion made by Naomi, seconded by Lori. All those in favor say aye. Four zero zero. Consent agenda. There is one nomination in your packet tonight for Megan Reynolds, elementary teacher at Reeds Ferry School. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion made by Ken, seconded by Lori Rothhouse. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. 400. Zero, zero. Committee reports. Lori. All right. So Parks and Rec met on September 18th. Uh, just a couple things they're still looking for an assistant director currently they're reviewing all of the parks for safety um, there was an Eagle Scout presentation the Halloween party is October 26th um, but the one that I think is really really exciting is they're doing a logo contest for the website for Parks and Rec and I would love to have some students um, take you can go on the Parks and Rec website 
And we have so many artistic people in our school district that, that could create the new logo for Parks and Rec. It's been the logo that they have for like 20 years. So they're looking for something, fresh ideas. And I would love for a Merrimack High School student or middle school student to design that. Yeah. May I just say we've just approved the distribution of that flyer through to all of our students. Great, Ken. Yeah, we had our first professional development committee meeting uh, last week. A um, lot of familiar faces. I don't, I didn't, I don't think I saw many new faces there. I'm still looking for some members. I think it was Reeds that was. Um, we're still looking for some rep representation there, but um, some great discussion about approval for a lot of uh, professional development opportunities. Our teachers participated in this summer, so that was nice to see. Um, and then. Um, I think, what am I missing anything? Amy was there too. There was no, you've hit it. This was yeah. our, we were looking at approving things from the summer. Right, it was yeah. kind of a getting up and running meeting. There so. it is. Yep. Yeah, it was good. I will have a report for joint loss. We meet Thursday. We approved the, we approved the at the last meeting, the um, safety handbook. So it'll be an interesting meeting to have an update. Great correspondence. I'll go first. Uh, lots of parent emails again, beginning of the school year. I had, um, and, and you all were CC'd on a number of emails regarding special education. Uh, we had um, a couple emails about the middle school lunch. And then I've had a number of conversations uh, regarding curriculum and I've, uh, some of those were just one-on-one -on -one people that knew me uh, and then a lot of them were uh, engaging administration that I just, they, the writer CC'd me on, but I'm letting administration handle those curriculum questions. Amy's doing a great job meeting with parents, answering questions, concerns. And uh, those were the only correspondence I had. Anybody else? Just the ones that were CC'd to everybody. Okay. All right, comments from the school board. Lori. So first of all, I want to say um, John Zyla was actually Matt's great-grandfather. <laughs> I messed that up. It's not his grandfather. And second of all, I just want to let the public know again that the Merrimack Forum is not how we communicate. And so, you know, our email addresses, please feel free to email us, feel, you know, tr try to go through the chain of command. But um, that's where sometimes um, misinformation gets out there and, and the intent of that communication is lost. And I would also add to that, um, we all have lots of friends who like to text us or, or DM us, but when it comes to uh, serious questions or concerns about the district, we would prefer if you would use our emails because sometimes we need to loop someone in. And that is much easier for us to do if you communicate via email with us as board members versus sending a text, which I mean, again, it's easier. It's, you know, oh, it's my friend, Lori, I'm just gonna text her real quick. But it, it really, if it's, if it's a serious concern or question that you have regarding your child's school or what they're learning or the district, please use our official email so that if we need to loop in an administrator, we can do that. And just to add on to that, Lori, and I know we've said this before, but if you, if you put all of us on an email, we are officially in a meeting at that point. That's a public meeting. Minutes need to be taken. It needs to be publicized. So. Um, we cannot all respond to those, and that's why we've designated the chair to be our representative in that case. So, And along with what Ken said, if you've addressed Bill or Amy um, and you've just CC'd on us, you probably will not get a response other than an acknowledgement that we've received your email because we are going to let administration handle administrative things uh, if and when, and there's never been a win so far that it's risen to a board concern. But we do appreciate the communication and keeping us in the loop with what you are thinking and what you are experiencing. Go ahead, Ken. And something completely different. I'm also going to go back to the beginning of the meeting just to mention uh, one of Bill's um, updates that he gave about the Modern Band All State, which is brand new this year. And I'm really excited about it because I'm on the committee. So um, <laughs> it's the fact that we had four students from Merrimack make that. It's just to put it into context, we have a number of all state festivals in the state that kind of focus on different we have a jazz all state we have a classical all state we have a band 
you know, you know we have an orchestra. This is something that's brand new, uh, where it's featuring and focusing on modern styles of music, rap and, and country and pop and heavy metal and all these things. And consistently across the board, we have Merrimack representation, not one or two kids, but a significant chunk of these groups feature Merrimack students in it. So just another example of how um, just top notch our music department is because there's no festival New Hampshire can offer that we're not going to show up to. Uh, and I think that again, just speaks highly K through 12, our entire music program here in the state. It's just super impressive. When I was looking at the submissions, I was like, of course, there's a ton of Merrimack kids here. Um, so just job well done to those folks. And lastly, I want to thank the community. We had three teams out in the rain on Saturday, fundraising, field hockey, soccer, and basketball. Uh, those students were braving the weather. It, it, we hadn't had rain for weeks, and then the day that we have three teams going out to fundraise, it's pouring. But I want to thank the community of Merrimack that came out and supported those students at the locations they were at, especially at the dump, which is always a fun place to fundraise and participate. And just, again, thank you for the support for those teams. Lastly, I will open up the floor to public comments on agenda items. As always, the, our last uh, section of public comment is on the items on our agenda for tonight. It, you are welcome to come and introduce yourself, state your name and address, and if you're a student, you never have to state your address. Hi, good evening. I'm Heather Robitaille, 45 Springfield Circle. Um, I was definitely excited to see Matthew Brown get recognized tonight by Representatives Rung and Murphy and our State Senator Shannon Chandley. Um, it's just great to see that kind of advocacy that he has done and working to pass legislation at his age before he can even vote that will save lives of high school students across New Hampshire is really amazing. Um, it's a testament to him, his family, and, and to our community and our schools as well. Um, I think we have a lot to be proud of as a district as, and a community. Um, it's great to hear all the recognition of the work that's being done by our school staff our parent, teacher groups, student musicians, and groups like Chop Shop who do so much to reach out to the communities and really have a positive impact. Um, to our chair, Lori Peters, thank you for sharing the school board goal to presentation. Um, I think we really have a mission statement that staff, students, and community members alike can proudly stand behind. Um, in addition to the recommendations that were made for prominently displaying it, it would be great, I think, to also have it on the website um, just so that we could reference that. Um, I know we can't ask questions, but I, I hope that those slides are available to the public as well. I didn't see them in the supporting materials, but I, I'd love to get a chance to go through those again. Um, and I especially appreciate the goal of communication with families. I think we know how important it is to be involved, to be transparent, and to have respectful dialogues. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. And the updates that um, Bill and Matt gave regarding our changing demographics and also state funding. As we're heading into budget season, uh, we're heading towards elections. I think it's really important for our community to understand that it's state level decisions, not this board's decisions in many cases that tie our hands. And as property owners are really validly concerned about tax rates, um, that they look at how our representatives are voting when it comes to things that shift the burden onto our tax owners, such as the education freedom accounts that uh, Matt mentioned. Um, so I think as we move forward as a community and we are informed and we share respectful thought and fact-based dialogue, um, we'll just continue to be better <coughs> together. So thank you. Thank you. And yes, they'll be, they'll be available, the slides. <laughs> I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I will second. Mo uh, moved by Naomi, seconded by Ken. All those in favor say aye. Four zero zero. Thank you and good night.